vector valued functions, and space curves. So introduction here. Similar to the vector equations of lines and space, we can express curves in space with a vector equation. Um, in general, the idea is to think of a particle moving through space along a path over some interval of time t. It's common to think of the input t as time. Uh, I think it's helpful. The coordinates of the location of the particle at time t, any time in that interval, can be written parametrically as x of t, y of t, and z of t, a point in space. Now, a curve is defined as the collection of points, all of those points together, for every t in that time interval. We also call this idea a particle's path. So a vector equation of a curve can be given by, if you know the parametric equations for the individual coordinates, then the position vector will be just the result of each of those parametric equations, x of t, y of t, and z of t, uh, and the x, y, and z component of your position vector. So again, r of t outputs a position vector for the particle at a point in time t. And then x of t, y of t, and z of t are also called component functions. And component functions are scalar functions. That's important to note here. Uh, they don't have the bold notation by them because they don't output a vector. They output a number, a, an x coordinate or component of the vector. Coordinate of the point, component of the vector. So let's take a look at some examples, just some general curves in three space. And uh, hopefully this will be informative to kind of wrap our heads around this idea a little more. All right, so again, all these uh, links are live as well if you want to play with them. But let's see here, let's get this centered on the screen. So what we've got here is notice there's a, well, let me get this loaded. There's kind of a very, very faint uh, um, cylinder there, which looks like this. And if I hit play on this Tmax slider here, notice what happens, watch what happens. There's a vector that points from the origin, a position vector to a point on this curve. So kind of what I've plotted is I've plotted the, the vector valued function plotting out this space on the curve, which is kind of a helix that's wrapped around this cylinder, which extends further than I have the graph zoomed in to see. So there's one curve, go ahead and pause it. Here, let's look at another curve. This time we'll get Q and Q visible. Yeah, vector Q is visible as well. And so here's a little tighter helix. Um, as time passes, as T varies, the vector valued function outputs that position vector to a point on that curve. That's Q. And the third curve we have is this one, P, which is wrapping even faster. All of these curves are wrapping around this helix, this or this cylinder, so they're called a helix. And if you view them from on top, uh, they're just going around that unit circle. Why is that? Well, off to the left, you can see that x is defined to be cosine of 5t, and y is sine of 5t, and cosine of whatever for x coordinate, sine of whatever for y coordinate, as long as the inputs are the same, is going to give you the unit circle, as we can see here. All right. Let's take a look at the other examples we have. All right, so I'll get this loaded. And first we'll look at this H function here. What do we got here? So as time is passing, this position vector is tracing out a curve in space and kind of a curve. This one looks like another helix wrapping around a cylinder there. So now let's look at one of the other ones. We'll turn H off and I don't know, let's look at P for fun here. Hey, check that out. Well, this isn't wrapping around a cylinder. This is making some kind of a little curve being traced out in space here as time passes. From above, again, it's still just going around the unit circle, but we're tracing out a very different curve in pace, if curve in space. I think we've done R yet. R is kind of a fun one to look at. So what's happening here? 
as we watch it being drawn in space, we see it's making a neat curve here and things are happening. Let's take a look at what it's, well, let's look at the way it's defined. R is sine of 3t cosine of d, and y is sine of 3t sine of d. So if we were to take the z out of the picture, what would we get here? So in the xy plane alone, we're tracing out the three leaved rows. We're just doing it uh, vertically through there as well. Now, which one do we start with? I think we started with q. So we did p, we did h. OK, so we haven't looked at q yet. So let's turn q on. Oh my goodness, q is kind of wild. Let's see if we can zoom out here by doing this. Sure can. Q is tracing out this sort of spring, which would be wrapped around a torus in space. The point here is not to worry too much about exactly what these things are or why they happen, but more about the concept of as you change time, it outputs that position vector, which goes to a point in space that's on our particular curve. And I must apologize, I have helixes and some curves mixed up. The links are uh, going to the opposite things. So whenever we talk about functions, one of the first things we talk about is the domain. So we'll start by talking about the domain of a vector valued function. It's the intersection of the domains of its component functions. Each of the component functions may have its own individual domain. And if it doesn't work for one of them, then it doesn't work for all of them or if it doesn't work for all of them, it doesn't work for any of them. So whenever you're asking a question about domain, we should ask the question, what values are allowed as an input? But that's like saying, hey, what am I allowed to do? Well, I'm allowed to do a lot of things. In general, it's a much easier question to answer, what could possibly go wrong? And so domain restrictions are usually related to the fact that we're not allowed to divide by zero and that there are no negatives underneath roots, although there are cases where it's not either of these two. These are by far the most common domain restrictions we're going to see. So this example, once it loads, shows that it's not always division by zero or things. Um, this little off to the left, A is equal to the sort of, uh, let's call it brackets without tops. That's the floor function where it rounds down to the nearest integer. And we've got the x, y, z coordinate here to find to be that floor function. So as we let t vary, uh, as it goes, any value of 3, it's going to round down to 3. Every value of 2 point something is going to round down to 2. And you can kind of see that happening there. So that's just kind of a fun example, meant to be fun. All right, continuing on. The next thing we need to talk about is we're working our way towards calculus with vector valued functions. So we want to talk about differentiation and then we'll get into integration. But first, in order to talk about differentiation, we need continuity. And for continuity, we need to talk about limits. So limits are uh, the limit of a vector valued function at any input t is the limit of the component functions at t. Just like in calculus one, in single variable calculus, um, limits are very, very nice. They behave well. As such, limits are match our already established understanding of single variable uh, limits uh, functions, of limits of single variable functions. But formally, if we were to write it out, if we have a vector valued function, r of t is equal to the x component x of t plus the y, y of tj plus z of tk, and any real number a within the real number system, then the limit as t approaches a of our vector valued function r is equal to the limit of each of the component functions. So limit of x of t as t approaches a in, in the x direction and limit of y of t as t approaches a in the j direction or the y direction for j and the limit as z of z of t as t approaches a in the z direction for k. So what does it mean to be continuous at a point? So again, our usual R of t generic vector valued function here is continue at a point t0 in its domain if the limit exists. So the limit as t approaches t0 of our function R matches the function R's output at t0. So the informal checklist for continuity is the output exists. First, you can't, it's not continuous if our, our function doesn't exist at t0. The limit exists. 
sure enough, the limit as t goes to t0 of r of t has to exist. And then the third thing is that the output and the limit agree. So the limit is equal to some value. And that value is the function evaluated at that point. And then the function is said to be continuous if it is continuous at every single point in its domain. Notice the definition doesn't include exclusions of your domain here. And so these are all concepts we've seen before in single variable calculus. And so this one's a short one today.